From University of Maryland, University College, this is Thursday Thoughts with Dr. Alan Drimmer. This series features faculty and friends of UMUC highlighting areas of academic expertise. Welcome to Thursday Thoughts. I'm Alan Drimmer, Chief Academic Officer at University of Maryland, University College. And today I'm very pleased to be joined by Jesse Varsalone, a professor, a collegiate faculty member at the university, uh, and also academic advisor to a much beloved uh, cybersecurity team we have called the Cyber Padawans, uh, and it has built so much morale and enthusiasm at the university. So thanks for joining us. No problem. Today we're talking about cybersecurity, and uh, I wanted to start by talking about um, young people versus older people today and how they view cybersecurity. Sometimes you hear that younger people are uh, less concerned about privacy issues, uh, and but sometimes you know, the people say, well, no, younger people are more aware of all the dangers that are out there. But as you, your work with both younger students and, and older students, do you notice any patterns in how people are, 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 are viewing privacy issues? I mean, I can't say there's any specific patterns, but generally I would say that um, people who are older are much more concerned about privacy in general. I notice I um, use Facebook myself. I'm a heavy user, and I notice that people do things like post their um, paychecks, post their bank accounts, post their um, personal information, where they work, um, post things about medication post some of the most uh, crazy things that you would think that you would want to keep private. So I think in general, with the proliferation of Facebook, Twitter, um, there's Snapchat, there's Instagram, there's um, all other types of uh, things people use like Slack and Discord. People are just, younger people are just a lot more eager to give out their information um, and uh, they don't realize that that's going to have consequences. Also, you know, some of the things they do when they're younger can come back to haunt them. And we've seen uh, some of these incidents recently. Um, I can remember some things with uh, some posts with some professional athletes that made about 10 years ago, and that information is still on the internet. So um, basically, I would say um, younger and younger seem to be less and less concerned. I think I think some of the older people in my family and my associates really value their privacy. And for example, I know some people that are like, I'm not going to bank online because I'm worried about my privacy. I'm still going to go to a teller. Well, pretty soon they're going to start charging to go to tellers. And uh, you know, it's it's just becoming a different world. And I think that the younger generation has accepted it. One area we didn't go into is like, you know, you can go into Facebook, you can go into Buffalo Wild Wings, you can tag that you're there, you can take pictures there, you can post those pictures to Google Maps, those pictures say who's who you're with. Um, uh, basically, Google has a timeline of everywhere you've driven, um, all over the map. Those are things that would absolutely, I think, alarm some of our, uh, my older colleagues in general. Right. Um, no, I, I, I agree. So, so just, just on that topic, what are some of the, um, let's say, the best and the worst information sharing practices that you see today? I mean, um, specifically about security, the biggest concern I think everyone really needs to be worried about that you might not think of is just your phone and your um, your computer leaving those somewhere in a public place where someone could get them because if, if someone's able to get your phone and get into your phone or just pull out your SD card um, they can get pictures they can tag the locations of those pictures they can if they are able to get into your computers you know as as a computer professional I, I know how to break into Windows and and without the password and if I can get into someone's system you know I would I could virtually know their entire life you know you could figure out what, what websites they visit what, what they go to their information documents about social security numbers their taxes are on their computer so um, the real danger is to um, to you know leave that stuff but there's also you know the same exact thing can happen 
if your system gets hacked, um, you can uh, basically, a hacker can steal everything your computer uh, and put it out there on the dark web or something like that. So there's that. And then of course, there's also the whole crypto locker thing where you may have you know 20 years of documents from various education places that you value and maybe you don't have a backup and they get locked and then they demand a ransom. I mean, that can really, they can really hurt a lot of companies. We've seen that kind of thing. So um, it's just, it's the valuable information you have on your devices and if somehow a hacker is able to get that or someone takes your phone, I mean, that can really put you in a, in, in a possibly a, a compromising position for a number of reasons. Right. I, I recently uh, lost my computer and I tried to use the uh, find my iPhone or find my computer and disable it. Is that, it. Was that a smart thing to do? Is that wise? Is that effective? Um, yeah, those are. I actually know someone who was able to recover his um, uh, MacBook. He came back from a, a trip in, uh, in Europe, and he came back on the plane, and he was he didn't get any sleep, and he left his laptop under the seat, and so um, he went right back up to BWI and said, you know, this happened, and they said, well, we checked the plane; it's it's not there. The plane had already gone back to Europe. Um, so they um, he, he they assumed it was the cleaning crew. Um, it, he got a notification that the um, laptop came on here in Prince George's County. It was turned on, so he went back up to the investigator. Um, they took uh, because of the area it was in. They took they took some other police officers, and they were able to get get it back. Um, luckily, um, they were trying to wipe it and just sell it, but luckily. Um, what had happened is he had like the carbon backup, which was backing it up, but all he didn't use internet on the um, plane from Europe. So all that he lost about four hours of work or five hours of work. He didn't lose everything though. So yeah, th those are great right. ways to um, do that. I also had get an email anytime my son logs in to Gmail anywhere on any new device or m the same thing with me. So I get I get email notification anytime that I'm logged into a device in case it's not me. So um, there's there's stuff like that. There's two-factor authentication where you basically have to put in a pin to use your email and your phone is connected to it also. So those are... Should we all I, be doing that? I mean, it's it's the expense sometime and, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do it, but it's people have to weigh, you know, how much is that worth to me? Uh, those services cost you, I, I assume you had to pay for that. It's, it's what, $100 a year or something like that. Mm, I don't know. It seems like okay. it'd be, okay, but, um, well, listen, so tell us about you. How did you get involved in this field and how did you eventually come to UMUC? Okay, well, I don't like to make myself old but I actually started doing this stuff in the 80s <laughs> I started with you know some of the most basic computers that were available at that time I had an interest in computers um, I went to college uh, pursued uh, degrees with that but the interesting thing is when I graduated uh, in 1994 with my master's degree um, that was actually that same month was when the first version of Windows came out so basically since then uh, from 1994 to 2018, I've been using Windows, and I've used every version of Windows that ever came out and seen all the features, and I even still have a copy of some of the versions of Windows, like Windows 95 and Windows 3.1 on floppy disk in my basement. <laughs> so I, I've, I've been there the whole way Holy along. Holy goody goody. <laughs> I've seen the whole evolution of everything at, along the way, and that's been one of the great things that my career has offered that, you know, say someone who graduates um, and goes on to do what I'm doing, uh, they probably will have missed, you know, a big part of that evolution of everything. So I've always had an interest in it. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about this field is it really keeps the mind sharp because, you know, the new version of iOS comes out, the new, the new iPhone comes out, the new Samsung comes out. There's always... So there's a new version of Alexa. There's always something new and exciting to learn. And uh, I think it offers, you know, for example, if you, you know, say you study, uh, I don't know, 
16th century poetry or you study something, you know, like uh, art from a certain period of time, probably your knowledge would always be valid. But, you know, you, if I go on an island for three years, I come back and I'll be lost. I won't know what's going on in the field. So um, it, I like that, you know, the constant changing um, that's going on. So with UMUC specifically, um, I was a contractor at the DOD and two of the other uh, people on my team were teaching here. I said, I want to teach there. <laughs> so I became an adjunct and I was teaching online. And then... Um, what were it, you teaching? Do you remember? I do. <laughs> the first course I taught, I taught the Microsoft um, Windows and then I also taught ethical hacking later on. So, um, uh, and we still have those courses now. All our courses map to certifications. I had the certifications and I, I taught those. Uh, we were using a different interface back then. We used, uh, L, we had a custom LMS bot made by UMUC called Web Tyco, which was like revolutionary when it was made. Um, and we used that and mm -hmm. it, it was a lot different, but it was the same, if, if you will, that, you know, I was still delivering the same messages to students and we were interacting and, and we were having good dialogue. Right. So um, that's how I came here and I came here full time in 2015. Wonderful. Thanks. Well, we're lucky to have you. Um, going back to kind of how you use technology, tell us about your setup. How do you protect yourself, um, you know, with your devices? Uh, what do you do? Are there certain apps you use? Are there certain practices aside from making sure you don't lose stuff? Um, sure. But, but how do how do you how, how are you set up yeah that's kind of an interesting and different question so um, you know I do use really long passwords I've noticed like when I was changing my passwords one time I was particularly concerned about an account or something and I tried to use like a 28 character password on PayPal that a lot of these sites have a restriction of how long your passwords can actually be. For example, Microsoft, I think, is Outlook is 16 characters. So, it's, so, you know, having a good complex password is one thing that everyone will tell you. Of course, I go a little bit further than that because um, I, I do different things. So some of the times I'm doing things for classes or development or the Padawans, and I actually have to create malware or viruses. So I have to actually turn my own antivirus off or it will capture it into. So so I do a little bit different things and then sometimes I have to go get things from sites that might have malware or they're unscrupulous and we have basically, which I'll talk about later, we have something called virtual machines and they can go anywhere and do anything and if they get damaged, basically there's just a reset button and you can take it back to the state before it uh, got mm -hmm. compromised. So I use a lot of that type of technology. Um, one of the interesting thing, I was gonna show a picture, but you know, I started when I was really getting off the ground in the field uh, with basically a room full of computers. And there was, there were Macs, there was, you know, there were Windows, there was, Linux, there were different hard drives, there were servers, there was all these wires. I actually blew the power and uh, BGE had to come out and look at my wiring because I had so much. But really I can do all that, you know, basically on a single laptop these days because the power of the laptops and not only that, I can, you know, I can do things up in the cloud and manage them in the cloud. And so um, really, uh, the ability for you to do so many more things with just such, you know, just with one laptop, you know, I, I can do my work from anywhere. And well, let me ask you about that. I, I was reading an interview with the uh, one of the New York Times technology correspondents, um, and uh, they asked they asked her about this issue, how she handles her kind of technology setup and protects herself. And she said that she keeps personal and work um, email and, and uh, all kinds of files on separate devices, two phones, two laptops, things like that. Is that a good idea? That is a great practice. Um, 
but um, I actually was advising uh, a, a friend about that who has a small <laughs> law, law firm. The, the issue with that a lot of times, so, so it is a great practice, but there's, you know, there's, there's cons and pros. If you take me, I, I have my own personal laptop. I'm so efficient on it. I know where everything is. I know where everything is. And one of the other things is I need certain level of rights to do some of the things I do on a daily basis. Often, if you're given a, a work laptop, you may have to call IT to install a software program or something like that. Um, sometimes they don't update them all the time. So there's a real balance of doing that. Um, you, you, the, what I told that that lawyer was, you just have to weigh with the amount of product, productivity you think someone's going to do. I said also, you know, you're going to have your intellectual property is going to be on that person's personal device. So you have to say, you know, do I have a policy that if they separate from the company that I can search the device and make sure it's all deleted? So. It, it's very complex, um, you know, it, 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 that's all really security is. It's a balance of, of we can make things so secure that, you know, we can't even check our email or we can, you know, try to make it a little bit less rigid and we're much more productive, but then maybe there's a security incident. So it, finding the balance is really a, a lot of what this right, industry right, is right. about. So uh, what do you think about Alexa? Um, do well, you have, I, do you have one? I have two. You have two. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing. Um, have you ever seen like the wind up music boxes that, yeah. You know, well, um, Alexa actually, um, solves a problem for me. I used to use those and of course then they don't work after time and I bought a lot of them, but, um, I actually use Alexa to put both of my children to sleep. I'm a single dad and, uh, they both get three Alexa songs, and I sit in the room, and then I walk out, and it puts them both to bed. Now, what's cool is that I can actually go on there, and if it's a phone, it's, if it's, it's a, I go on my phone, and I can turn it off without going into their bedrooms or lower the volume or go right. to the next song. So um, that really, and then a, a, there's a history. So if you know we're in bed and they're they're just you know, they're like, oh I really like that song then I can go find out what that song is I have a history of everything that was played right. say, oh, but are, are like you that. concerned um, <laughs> by some of these reports that um, that Alexa actually could provide you know you become a kind of a microphone uh, for people listening in that's you know what about from a security perspective um, well, I actually experienced that personally. We actually have, we have two Alexas. We have the Google Home, which we're not as big of a fan of, and we have the Microsoft Cortana. And uh, I was, something got spilled on the carpet, and I said to, um, I basically said to my daughter, I said, we, we're going to have to get some carpet cleaner or something. And Cortana came on while I she was off and she just came on and she said if you need carpet cleaner i can make these following <laughs> suggestions and i was very shocked by that at the time so at i think that was my first wake up call to these devices are you know listening and chiming in to your to your life so um but then again i also have to counterbalance that with you know the most difficult time for any parent is bedtime of young children. And I've got my kids going to bed. <laughs> Great, I got them on a perfect routine. I even have to bring the Alexa to hotels when we travel sometimes because you know, that's what, that's what right, they're so used you're to. Sacrificing your privacy <laughs> for a little help with bedtime. Peace at stories. night. Okay. Yes. Um, no, I, I, it's interesting. Um, uh, well, and it gets back to the kind of issue we were talking about at the beginning about how much are people willing to compromise on privacy for the benefits that they receive from this sure. kind of technology. Um, I mean, Google Maps is another example. Um, you know, you, you could live without it, but it's better to live with it. But when you live with it, you, you're also giving up some things. And But do you realize you're giving up some things? And it's, it's one of the, it, it's really one of the things that's, um, it's, it's a very important thing that I think is easy to forget about. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, another thing that's obviously that's so wonderful about you is is your commitment to the Cyber Padawans. Could you tell tell people um, what it is, where the name came from, 
um, you know, what what are the benefits for for you and students? Tell, tell us about the Cyber Padawans. Absolutely, I could talk about that topic uh, a, a lot. So, um, uh, U- UMUC um, doesn't actually have a basketball team or a football team or um, any of those types of, of sports teams, uh, but the one team they have is the Cyber Padawans. And most of our students are adult learners, many about 60% are in the military, and many of them work in the field. And many of them work in the field and they're still pursuing the degree for, you know, to get promoted or to get a different job. So our teams tend to have people that um, actually do this stuff. And we we do really well in competitions because we actually have students that are practitioners and often they're competing against, uh, um, you know, people from a traditional four-year college that uh, maybe stay on campus and take some classes but haven't worked in the field but, you know, are studying a lot. So it, it's, in, it's an interesting contrast um, and uh, our students have been very successful. We actually have, um, we have alumni on the team, we have professors on the team and we have current students, undergrad, grad, part-time, full-time. We have a variety of, of uh, different um, teams. We've had professional, sometimes the contest. What, what does it mean to have a cybersecurity team? What is, are there, is it, yeah, what do they do and what do you do while they're doing it? Is it like Twitch where you watch other people playing a game? What, right. what is it? It all, it all depends on the rules of the competition. So um, for example, um, many times there's, Sometimes there's something called a capture the flag where there's various puzzles in cryptography or whatever and the students solve those puzzles and then they score points and then there's a leaderboard. Um, That's a typical one. But then there's also ones that are more like a red team, blue team exercise where either there'll be a group of hackers. um, uh, Some of our, our, actually our students and alumni sometimes are that group of hackers and they will hack into the students' computers and the students will get them out. Or there can be where the students get to try to hack into various machines and capture flags. So um, those are the types of exercises. What I'm doing, it depends. Um, Some of them are online. So um, I'm sleeping while they're doing a 24 hour online one. Sometimes Sometimes I'm there on site. Sometimes I'm competing if if it's uh, anyone, if it's not a student-only thing, I will actually compete right. in the events. And um, you know, they really are things that we will see a lot of employers. So we went to one at the University of Maryland, and we got a special challenge right. And they said we will offer anyone who was on the team an an internship, basically a job that because you got that and question right, and everyone on our our team already had a job wow. <laughs> so no one took them off on the opportunity but we have you know employers are it's a very visible thing these competitions right. for employers because they they feel that the people that can solve these things often they have good troubleshooting and problem solving skills and we've had you know some of our um most famous padawans have gone on to work for big companies and inclu- including google um, Cisco. They're not that big. And Mercedes Benz parent company, whatever. Right. Daimler. I so, think it's- so uh, I'm a nerd, and I, so I know the answer to this. But what tell what does Cyber Padawan mean? What is it? Sure. So, um, Dr. Baskar actually came up with the the name originally, and it comes from Star Wars. And Padawan is the person that's not quite ready for a Jedi yet. So the idea is, you know, they will take a they're trial, in they're in training, and they will ultimately become a cyber Jedi. So I, I, I actually love the concept, the idea. Um, it was, it was Dr. Baskar's idea. <laughs> it was Dr. Baskar's idea. I didn't know idea. that much about Star Wars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that we have that reputation in the uh, IT industry that we're big Star Wars and Star Trek fans. Right. <laughs> um, so. Well, thank you. It's it's a it's really it's it's a fun thing, but it's also on a serious note. You know, providing kind of practical opportunities for people to use their skills and critical thinking um, in uh, in the moment is very much something we talk about here. And I I, I love, we try to build projects into uh, the learning environment, and then seeing you do it 
in a sort of fun way is is really inspiring to people and people do pay attention and um, uh, you're a personality here and, and so is the team and so uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I see with cybersecurity um, and a few other fields like data analytics and to some degree cloud computing is that you can think about those as self-contained fields like business and law and education. Um, but one of the most interesting things is the way that a field like cybersecurity um, relates and can uh, pertain to some of these other fields, so what I call kind of mashups. Sure. So for example, um, cybersecurity and, and law or cybersecurity and finance are fascinating topics that a lot of people are very interested in now. Um, and even when somebody says they're going to be interested, they're going to work in cybersecurity, many times they'll have in mind a specialization. Healthcare, for example. We've seen uh, on a previous interview, I interviewed uh, Dr. Jim Coker, um, whose field is bioinformatics, which is the combination of analytics and healthcare. Um, what are some of the most interesting mashups or combinations that you think are out there or could be out there? Um, in terms of kind of academic, almost bespoke academic subfields, so cyber plus blank. What do you what 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 are the some of those combinations that you think are interesting and relevant to the labor market? We well, you mentioned cyber and law. I think that specifically um, a lot of the the laws haven't caught up to some of the things that we're dealing with now. So I think that is particularly of interest. Um, uh, you talked about also the cyber and education. Specifically, um, I think cyber education uh, is kind of like that those two as a partner, there's, it's a kind of a little bit of a game changer for what you just mentioned previously, you know, having hands-on things, but we also have um, these industry certifications. Um, at UMUC, each class in the CNAS is mapped to a Cisco or a Microsoft or a certified ethical hacker or some type of certification. And uh, a lot of the employers are accepting people for work um, when they have those certifications. Sure, right. So it's kind of like I've had students with associates only um, who had a certain number of certifications already getting jobs and uh, students that hadn't completed at UMUC um, with a certain number of certifications get jobs because the certification level kind of tells the employer okay they're going to come to me with these skill sets and I'm not going to need to train them at, when right. they come in the door so I really think that that is kind of a game changer because um, it allows uh, people to start working maybe maybe prior to completing right. and uh, then you get that work experience and then you can really relay it relay it to back to your classes so I think you know especially in this day and age where people are worried about you know the money they're spending for college that cyber really with all the job openings and maybe the opportunity to even start work before you even finish your degree that right. that would be very appealing to to somebody probably right. um, and and parents as well. Right. So you're working with a lot of students, and I think you have exposure to backgrounds of a lot of different types of students. Um, is is the cybersecurity field only for techies? Do you have to like speak Klingon and know the dialogue from right. all the Star Wars movies to be um, a potential cybersecurity student, or is it does it is it suitable for people with more generalist backgrounds? So that, that is a great question. I actually talked about that. I, uh, UMUC partners with um, Flowers High School in Prince George's, and I actually went there and I talked to all the parents. And I said um, to the parents in the audience, I said, if your son or daughter is, has to fix the TV for you, or is fixing the Comcast box, or is configuring your Alexa, or is installing apps for you or doing any of these. Those are the kind of people we need in cyber. This is not the traditional 
computer science from the 80s where you had to be a mathematician and you had to get past calculus 3 and differential equations. We're more like a one math class kind of degree. Our emphasis is on the computers and the technology and these are things that a lot of our youth love and love doing. So after I gave that speech and I explained that and I could see the looks in people's eyes of yes my son just fixed that for me yesterday or my daughter fixed that or yes my daughter sets up my email I knew that I had hit home that they're like wait there's jobs here my, my, my child's good at this I am going to talk to my child and see is this something you would be interested in because I think it hit, hit home to a lot of the parents and they lined up after that <laughs> ready to talk to me and, and learn more so I really right. thought that you don't need to be you know, a mathematical uh, prodigy to do this field, which may have been the case 30 years ago. You know, there were people were writing their own programs for specific things. Now, um, there's so many tools available. There's you know, YouTube documentary on how to use these tools. If you if you're passionate about a technology, if you're one of those people I described, um, you you could be very successful in the cyber industry. Right, right. When I was growing up, um, there were people who used to work with ham radio op, ham radio operator people, and they, uh, I think those people developed into people that have good instincts for this. But, but I think it is. I, I, I see that it's more broad, and I meet a lot of people, as I said, with the with that mashup concept, who are more interested in other in specific fields, whether it be banking or or. Um, um, higher education or other things, but they're also super interested in, in cyber and the different ways that that um, relates to them. Uh, I'd like to switch to some of the policy issues. I mean, you can't look at the paper any day without seeing something that relates to cybersecurity now on, on the first or second page. It's just everywhere. Um, some of it's scary and um, some, of it's, some of it's not, but um, I guess I wanted to ask you, because you've been working in this field for so long, when did when did this become um, an important policy issue? I remember back in the, I guess it was in the 90s, I, I was working in the Treasury Department then, and um, there was a guy who worked in the, in the White House, uh, Dick Clark, he was a national security guy, and he, he started working on cyber terrorism. And I remember everybody saying to himself, like, what is that? And that can't be a thing. And wow, that sounds so strange. Um, and at that time, there was none of that. But then somehow, here we are. Like, what, were, there, were there one or two pivotal events that were sort of, you know, turning points when this became an important social and international security issue? I don't know if I can point to any specific event other than maybe one that comes to mind but you know a lot of these worms and viruses when when they first started coming out they were taking down like the state of Maryland for a couple days or taking down important um, uh, basically you know rendering anybody's ability to get any work done for a few days so I think that's when there started to be more awareness and the importance of security um, there was something called um, Stuxnet which um, basically uh, was a piece of malware that basically uh, messed with the nuclear in infrastructure. Well, explain that a little bit. That's an important. That did, I think that is. That was in 2010, I think, wasn't it? Yes. So basically, um, it's not really uh, divulged who came up with it. Nobody's but... <laughs> listening. You can tell us everything. You know. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, it's it's a piece of malware, and the idea was to basically speed up the nuclear reactors in Iran, and uh, basically uh, it rendered many of them inoperable, and uh, it took advantage advantage of some vulnerabilities in Windows, and uh, it did that type of thing. So, I mean, those that's an example, uh, but uh, the you know just all the devices being connected to the internet, power systems, power grids, uh, satellite systems, and there's a lot of devices out there that you know are out there with. Just so, so what I read just on Stuxnet, what I read, um, and I think the part that was unclear was whether or not, um, I think it, whether or not it came from Israel, the Israelis denied it, whether or not there was an American connection. But what I read was that after that event, 
that there were some papers that were published and some information was published on Wikipedia um, that explained how it worked and that people in the cyber security, ethical or not, community um, uh, paid attention to that. And so, and then there were all these sort of sons and daughters of Stuxnet that have developed, some of which are with us now. Is that is that right? I mean, the 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 software was repackaged and repurposed for different use, more or less. But just the idea of what it was doing, um, that's something that could be done. You could speed up a computer to the point right. of, of failure. And if that computer is regulating a, a water system or or a power system, if you cause the computers to malfunction, you know, we're, we're relying on everything we do. We're actually, you know, we, what, 95% of our students are online. We're, we're an online school. We are dependent on these technologies working every day, every time what, I log yeah. in. But know? what I think, what I find curious about that episode was that it wasn't just the advent of Stuxnet, but it was that this cybersecurity field, which is about security, in an effort to be, to be transparent about what that was, ended up releasing information, which I, I think has seems to have hurt us in in the in the longer term. It's interesting. Yeah. Yes, it could be used against us. Another event that that was um, maybe not a security, but like Katrina wiped out a lot of infrastructure, and I think there were many companies that never had a backup plan before that. And never had an off-site plan. And I think that, you know, I, I have a friend that went down there for about six months. So I think events like this bring awareness. What about Edward Snowden? Did he cause damage? Um, well, or, or awareness, maybe like Katrina, you know, an awareness that, that there were, we were at risk. Um, well, from what I've heard, he's caused the uh, slowing down of the clearance process and, you know, a lot more... Um, uh, they're being a lot more meticulous about background okay. checks for people with the NSA. So basically, um, you know, I, I do feel that he uh, he did he did a damaging thing by uh, breaking the the trust of the U.S. government and stuff. So I, I was I was very disappointed that that had happened. Right. Um, I remember reading last year, I think last year around this time, the U.N. Secretary General made a speech in which he talked about the dark side of innovation. Uh, specifically referring to cybersecurity threats and talked about the potential for a kind of cyber 9-11 that would um, incapacitate uh, our society or but cause real real lasting harm not just inconvenience um, other people said that was hype and an exaggeration where do, where do you stand on that uh, based on an article that I read last week um, I would say that is a threat so the article I read last week was talking about uh, basically, some Chinese company, they're, they're responsible. I guess China is responsible for about developing 80% of all computer motherboards and chips. And uh, they, they found an extra chip on a whole bunch of devices that were shipped. And basically, it was to allow for some type of backdoor or shutdown mechanism or... I don't think it was all disclosed in the article. But, you know, that's where you really have to be careful is that you know you're one country and all your technology is being made somewhere else and that obviously would give that country a huge uh, advantage if they were ever to plant something like that which has already been proven multiple times I'm sure you saw something similar on 60 minutes but um, that really uh, could be something that could be used um, it, right. it, against us. And that, that obviously is extremely concerning. We really aren't manufacturing all these things over here, and it, it puts us at risk for that reason. Um, so we're here in <clears throat> early October uh, 2018, and uh, the Trump administration recently released a cyber, um, uh, a new cyber strategy and that's gotten a lot of attention because apparently it includes not only uh, guidance about defensive cyber weapons, but also offensive cyber weapons. And, and some people have said it's dangerous to create offensive cyber weapons and it's not actually a deterrent, that it actually will inspire attacks rather than deter them. Um, what, what's your view of, of 
from a national security perspective, the, the advantages and disadvantages of having offensive and defensive cyber weapons? Well, they're, um, the offensive stuff is stuff that, you know, that that's already part of NSA's mission. If you go on the website, they have two missions. It's offense and defense. Um, some of their tools got leaked um, about a year ago, and those tools have offensive capabilities. And leaked what, or hacked? Um, I believe that, um, I don't know how they got, I, I believe somebody put them like on CD-ROMs or something and then put them on the internet. Uh, the uh, specific exploit I'm referring to is external blue, and that would allow you to break into a Windows 7 system at the time. But people can take that and they can repackage that for later operating systems or do different things. So I think the danger is they get out. Now, let's, one of the things is that that wasn't supposed to get out. Someone who worked for the, the agency didn't follow the rules and did something that was, you know, unscrupulous and actually probably a felony and, and you know, released that stuff to, to the wild. So the danger is, you know, the people that aren't doing what they're supposed to, um, really that, that is the danger of, of cybersecurity is people always, right? right? People are the ones that are giving away passwords or doing this or writing them on a notepad or leaking classified things that they shouldn't be so really it's about the people right uh, last question uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of cybersecurity is this is this an area where we can through technology address these concerns uh, or is are things going to get worse I'm always optimist. I'm optimistic about everything. Um, I do believe uh, if you have a degree in cyber, you want to work in cyber, you can be extremely optimistic about the job market as well as probably quite a, I, I'm, I'm positive I can finish my career in cyber for sure and probably my son too. I, I think that, you know, it. there's a lot of technology and uh, it, it, it's good for us. It, it can solve a lot of problems. The main issues that I've seen over this long career is when new things come out and we haven't really you know, tested them well enough and had enough time to vet everything, that's when we run into some vulnerabilities and some problems and uh, that, that, that can be extremely problematic for society. So, you know, since I started, you asked me about when I started, it's been a cat and mouse game. It continues to be a cat and mouse game and we you know, just have to make sure we're on the right side of it and you know, it, it, the bad part the bad times don't last too long so well listen thank you for being with us on thank Thursday you. thoughts and thank you for being part of UMUC and working with our cyber Padawans okay um, thank you so much and thank you thanks for watching Thursday thoughts with dr. Alan Drimmer this has been a production of University of Maryland University College.